Hi everyone, Peter here from Flow High Performance, and we're going to be covering how we can periodize our power training throughout the season for team sport athletes. So before we get into the details of how we can periodize our power training, we first need to understand a few power training constants. So these are going to be things that we're going to be doing the entire time, no matter what type of power training we're doing. The first is that we want maximal effort or intent. So no matter what type of power training you're doing, we always want to make sure that we're doing the exercise with absolute maximal effort and intent. Otherwise, we're simply not going to have the intensity to actually create the power adaptation that we're after. The next point is that we want low to moderate volumes for our power training. So we generally want to do power training when we're pretty fresh, so that way we can actually apply maximal effort and intent. If we are in a fatigue state, we're simply not going to get the same adaptations as when we are fresh. Similarly, if we do power training with really high volumes, we're not going to get that same intensity. So we want to keep the volume low to moderate in order to make sure that the quality is extremely high. The last point is that with our exercise selection, we always want to select ballistic exercises, which means that there is no deceleration. So we want to select exercises like jumps, throws, and bounds, rather than exercises such as traditional squats or deadlifts. And the reason is that because ballistic exercises don't have any deceleration to them, which is more similar to the muscle actions we see in team sports. So running, jumping, changing direction, accelerating, etc. They are explosive and they have no deceleration phase. So we can save our traditional strength training for our strength portion of the training program. But when we're training for power, we want to make sure that we're using ballistic exercises. Before we can select exercises for power training, we need to understand the force velocity relationship. There is a video on this YouTube channel that goes into detail on the force velocity relationship, and the link to that video will be in the description if you want to understand this concept in further detail. But for now, we'll just go over it briefly to get a basic understanding and how it applies to power training. So essentially, this relationship here is suggesting that exercises that require more force are going to be at a lower velocity, whereas exercises with higher velocity are not going to allow for very much force production. So if we select an exercise here, the force will be very high, but velocity is on the very low end. So to make this simple, if we think of a traditional back squat or a bench press, if we use 50% of our 1RM, we can probably move that weight pretty fast, but the force is obviously not as high because it's only 50%. Whereas if we use 90% of our best, the force will be much higher because it's a heavier load, but we won't be able to move that as fast as we could potentially move 50%. So to put this into the context of power training, in general for our power training, we want to sort of be between these two point tier roughly. So we're not on the absolute force end and we're not on the absolute velocity end. We want sort of moderate velocities and moderate force. So the training methods we employ we don't want to be really on either end of this relationship. We want to be able to move moderate loads explosively with moderately high velocities. And always that intent to move as fast as possible is going to be there. So we can save the high force exercises for our strength training, and we can save the high velocity exercises for our speed training. So with the force velocity relationship in mind, this is going to help us select exercises for power training. So we can categorize our power training into three semi-distinct methods. So we can have number one, force dominant power training, number two, velocity dominant power training, and then number three, reactive or elastic type power training. So force dominant power exercises will be exercises that are gonna be more on the force side of that force velocity curve, which therefore means the velocity is gonna be slightly lower. Velocity dominant power exercises are going to be exercises shifted more towards the velocity side of the spectrum. And then reactive or elastic power training are essentially going to be exercises that rely heavily on the stretch shortening cycle. So they're going to take advantage of the elastic properties of the muscles and tendons. So when we select exercises for our power training, they can be either force dominant, velocity dominant, or reactive slash elastic. So some examples of some force dominant power exercises can be things like weightlifting variations, so clean snatches and their variants, heavy trap bar jumps, so like we have here, basically like a trap bar deadlift, but 
instead of stopping at the top, we go into a full jump to make it ballistic. Squat jumps are similar to a trap bar jump, just with the barbell on the back. And then things like bottom up jumps, which is essentially like a counter movement jump, except we start in the bottom position, so there is no counter movement at all. And that's going to increase the reliance on force and eliminate the use of the stretch shortening cycle. So velocity dominant power exercises are essentially going to be the same as the force dominant ones, but the only difference is that we're going to use less weight or less load, and the velocity is therefore going to be faster. So exercises we might use could be unweighted jumps. So rather than having the non counter movement jumps, we actually want to use the traditional counter movement jumps, either broad jumps or vertical box jumps. We can still do squat jumps and trap bar jumps, but we will load it a lot lighter and therefore increase the velocity. Another exercise that could be good for velocity dominant power exercises is medicine ball throws. In general, medicine ball throws are going to be moved at faster velocities and have less force requirement just because they're quite light implements. That being said, we can do heavy medicine ball throws and make them a force dominant power exercise. And the last category are reactive slash elastic power exercises. These are going to be exercises where we're taking full advantage of the stretch shortening cycle. So some examples could be drop jumps, so dropping from a height and then trying to spend as little time on the ground as possible while maximizing jump height. Repeated hurdle jumps or cone jumps, so continuously jumping over some sort of implement and attempting to minimize ground contact time while maximizing jump height. A good horizontal reactive power exercise could be bounds, so basically similar to running, but the goal of bounds is to move the center of mass as far horizontally with each ground strike trying to minimize ground contact time. Another good exercise could be reactive throws, so similar to medicine ball throws, except in this case we're going to have a partner throw a ball to us and we're going to try and change the direction of that ball and launch it in the opposite direction. So we're actually going to be using the stretch shortening cycle in this instance, but more for the upper body rather than the lower body. And the last factor we need to consider when we're designing power training programs is force vectors. So essentially force can be applied in multiple directions. So with our power training we can do vertically oriented exercises like vertical jumping and vertical throwing and we can also do horizontally oriented exercises like horizontal jumping and horizontal throwing. So vertically oriented exercises generally have better transfer to athletic movements like vertical jumping and also maximum velocity sprinting because we have more vertical force direction during the upright maximum velocity sprinting phase. Whereas horizontally oriented exercises generally have better transfer to athletic movements like change of direction performance and also acceleration. So ideally in our power training programs, we want to have both vertically oriented exercises and horizontally oriented exercises because lots of these athletic movements are important for performance in team sports. So we want to be able to be good at vertical jumping, maximum velocity sprinting, also change of direction and acceleration as well. So now that we've gone through the background and the fundamentals of power training, we can get into the details of how we can actually periodize our power training. So as we previously went through, we essentially have three semi-distinct categories of power training we can train with. They're gonna be our force dominant power exercises, our velocity dominant power training, and then our reactive slash elastic power type training. So an example of how we can plan the mesocycle for a force dominant power training block may look something like this. So I have in this program two days and I have just put one power exercise on each day. So this might simulate something we would do throughout a training week where we include power training on two of those training days. So both of these exercises are gonna be heavily loaded and are gonna be more force dominant. However, the difference between the two is that one of the days we have a vertically oriented exercise and on the other day we have a horizontally oriented exercise. So here we have a trap bar jump, three sets of four at 60 kilos, and we're gonna keep the reps, the sets, and the load constant, and then in week four we're going to have a deload. So although there is no progression in volume or in load, we're gonna to aim to increase intensity by essentially jumping higher. And this can be measured if we have a jump mat, and each session we can measure our average and best jump height, at this arbitrary load of 60 kilos. We could also prescribe intensity via jump height and then auto-regulate the load based on that. 
However, this is getting into the nitty gritty details and simply doing the exercise with maximal intent should elicit the adaptations they were after. On the second day, we're gonna have heavy forward medicine ball throws. So this is gonna be a horizontal exercise. If we imagine holding a medicine ball in the hands on the chest, and then we use our legs and our arms to go into a small squat and propel the ball forward as far as possible. And in a similar fashion, we're gonna do three sets of four, and we're gonna have a fairly heavy load of 10 kilos, which should challenge the athlete to not be able to throw it too fast or too far. But again, this always depends on the level and the strength of the athlete. So again, with this exercise, we're not gonna change the reps, the sets or the load, but what we will do is we'll try and track the average and best throw distance. And that way we can measure progress to see if we're actually improving. And this is a simple one to measure because all you need is a medicine ball and some sort of marker to measure the distance and a tape measure. So if we keep the load and the reps and the sets the same on both of these, and we are increasing the height or the velocity, we can say that power is increasing since power equals force, so load times velocity, which is gonna be measured via jump height or throwing distance. We now have an example of a velocity dominant power mesocycle, and we have the same structure, and again, I've only picked two exercises one vertical and one horizontal and have also kept the reps and the sets the same so this time instead of having loaded exercises we have body weight jumps so probably two of the most simple power exercises but also very effective box jumps and broad jumps now these are going to be super effective so long as we put maximal effort and intent into them so to start on day one with our vertical power exercise, box jumps for three sets of four, and we're gonna keep the reps and the sets and the load exactly the same up until week four where we have a deload and we reduce the volume by reducing the number of sets. So box jumps can be fine to do by themselves. We don't need to try and jump on the highest box possible. It's more important to just make sure we're jumping as high as possible and landing on whatever box is available because we can still jump maximally regardless of the size of the box we jump onto. It's also not advised to try and jump onto a box as high as possible because that's going to increase the risk of injury. So if we have a jump mat, we can also track our average and best jump power. And we're going to, on average over time, attempt to increase our average and best power. If we don't have a jump mat, it's still going to work fine. You may just have to do some sort of other testing at a different time, such as a vertex vertical jump. On day two, where we have a broad jump, three sets of four with body weight and exactly the same pattern as day one. But this time it's very easy to measure. We can just attempt to increase our average and best jump distance. So if we do three sets of four and we record our best jump for each of those sets, we might then compare that week after week and block after block. And that way that gives us a number so that we can actually record if we're progressing since the reps, sets and load are gonna stay the same for the entire block. And lastly, we have an example of a reactive slash elastic power training mesocycle. So again, we have a vertical exercise and a horizontal exercise, same reps and sets as we previously did. This time we have a drop jump on day one and repeated bounds on day two. So we can progress a drop jump in two different ways. Number one, we can increase the height week to week to make it a more difficult exercise. The other thing we could do is we could keep the height exactly the same week to week. And again, if we have a jump mat, we can measure our reactive strength index or our ground contact time and our force. And then in a subsequent block, we can then maybe increase the height to increase the intensity and then keep that stagnant again. So it really depends on how much time you have and what works best in your situation. On day two, we have repeated bounds, which are essentially now a single leg exercise. So we're getting a bit more specific to movements we see in team sports. Again, we might, might do three sets of four reps on each leg, so eight total bounds. And each set of bounds, we may record that total distance for those steps and attempt to increase the average and best distance we do throughout the mesocycle. And as always, we have a deload in week four where we reduce the volume by reducing the sets. And now we can finally put all this information into the annual plan in order to allow the athlete to peak for their team sport at the right time.
This is a theoretical example annual plan for a team sport that I've created. So if we have a look first here in the matches row, we have a whole bunch of squares indicating when we have matches. So the darker the squares, the more important the match, and the lighter the squares, the less important the match. So we have our pre-season here with, with a few practice matches, and then we have our in-season period where we have our competitive matches. We then have our off-season and the start of pre-season later in the year. And then these have all been split up into training blocks or mesocycles. So with our power training, we can split this up throughout the year in order to make sure that we're peaking at the right time when we need to play at our best, so at these important matches. In general, we're going to get the most transfer and the most benefit to actions we see in team sport, like sprinting, changing direction, jumping, etc from our reactive power type training, simply because it's the most specific form of power training we can do. The second most transferable power type training we can do is the velocity dominant power. And then lastly, we have the force dominant power type training. So we can arrange to put different mesocycles of these three power training types throughout the year in order to allow us to perform our best when we need it. So starting here with the preseason, we're probably going to do more force dominant power because that's going to help us build that strength base and we have no matches that we need to be at our peak for. As we come into the season, we may want to switch up to some more velocity type power work. Then as we have a few important matches, we might want to do a short period of reactive type power training. Since we have much of the season to go, we don't want to lose those base force qualities that we developed. So we may do another short force dominant power block and then transition into a velocity dominant power phase. And then finally, as we get towards the end of the year with our most important matches, we may want to do a longer reactive slash elastic type power block in order to make sure that we're performing our best when it counts. Thanks for watching and hopefully you got something out of this video. Remember to subscribe if you haven't already.